two sermons today. Oh no, but they're both really short. Good. And one of them I didn't even write, which is weird. Um, but you can do the math on whether they fit together or not. I think they kind of do, but it's up to you. Uh, I picked today's scriptures that Fran read way back before uh, Christmas. I plan ahead a whole series. In our church, we often do a worship series where we take one kind of theme and we stick it together. And I know sometimes it gets too cute. Sometimes I move the pews around and almost get tarred and feathered, according to Ray back there. Uh, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it really helps my worship planning. So hopefully these series help get the gospel out to you a little cleaner and truthful and whatnot. But many churches, really a lot of them in the mainline traditions, many churches use a lectionary. So many, many decades ago, groups of, of people on a committee from all different kinds of churches come together and they decided to pick a whole bunch of scriptures that rotate through every three or four years, depending on which lectionary. And so all over the world right now, uh, well, in whatever this time is now, Catholics and Presbyterians and some Baptists and Episcopalians and Lutherans and all kinds of churches really share the same scripture each week, day in and day out. And so oftentimes the lectionary passages just stand on their own and that's just what it is. But once in a while, the passage for the day somehow just shines some light into, into what's going on in the world. And that's, that's amazing. When that happens, you really can't, uh, can't turn it down. So the lectionary passages chosen, I don't know, 50 years ago, uh, before there was a Martin Luther King Day, before there was any of the drama that we deal with, uh, the, the lectionary passage for today is from John 1, right in the beginning of the book of John. Tens of thousands of churches are reading that passage. And I know that there's many of them, probably a couple hundred, who are making one little translation difference, just a teeny one, uh, trying to figure out what Nathaniel was thinking rather than what he actually said. I know a lot of times in my life I'm thinking something that doesn't come out because once in a while I have a filter. Some of you don't have that filter. I know that happens, but a lot of us do. So, so I'm going to try to get through the Bible filter, and I know a lot of my pastor friends are doing that. But keep in mind, to get ready for this passage, just the little things if I was preaching just on this. One, this is John 1, beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he is recruiting all these disciples, which included a fisherman, a former Roman tax collector, uh, probably this revolutionary hothead Peter who's carrying a sword around all the time, and at least one, but probably only one, religious guy. Right? There's only one out of all those teenagers. Probably only one of them was really religious before Jesus showed up, uh, and that's Nathaniel. Also worth noting, number two, Bethsaida, the, the town that I'm about to read about, comfortable village on the north side of Galilee where the Jordan River comes down and flows into it. Jordan River's not all that silty at that point. So it's a nice place, a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting, a lot of grazing. In, in 30 AD, Rome went there and built a really beautiful bathhouse. Jesus started preaching about 30 AD, so this town was kind of on the map. Um, I compare it most for us to like, like Steamboat Springs, just a nice town, right? Number three, Nazareth, on the other hand, small, right near the, the desert, just in the low hills. It was poor, barely had any water, barely had anything. It was known for nothing. So think about the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. Like, not even a town, just the middle of nowhere, North Dakota. Uh, th three or four, whatever the point is. We know there's a tradition from a couple hundred years before Jesus that people who wanted to be a rabbi would actually go before that process, before they went to, to meet someone, and they would pray under a fig tree. I have no idea why fig trees were holy back then, but that they were. I don't get it, but for them, that's fine. Um, it, it's possible that that tradition actually happened a couple hundred years before anyone wrote it down. Uh, and if, it, if, it, if that didn't happen, this story is just kind of weird. Why was Nathaniel praying under a fig tree? The guess is he was probably studying to be a rabbi. Last point. Um, today, when you go to college, you get a letter that says... Accepted. Accepted. Congratulations. Awesome. Well done. And the way they said, congratulations, well done, you're accepted, in those days, is the rabbi would say, the, the, the formal term was, follow me. That's what a rabbi would say to an apprentice, follow me. So, here we go. Lectionary passage, John chapter 1. The next day, Jesus wanted to go to the country of Galilee. Uh, he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Philip was from the town of Bethsaida, uh, as well as Andrew and Peter were from that town also. Philip found Nathanael and said to Nathanael, we have found the one. The one that Moses wrote about in the Torah. He is the one the early preachers wrote about. He is Jesus of Nazareth son of Joseph. Nathaniel said, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of the shithole Nazareth? <laughs> Philip said, Philip said, come and see. Just come and see. So Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and, and said, Jesus said, see, there is a true Jew. There is nothing false in him. And Nathaniel said to Jesus, how do you know me? Jesus answered, 
Uh, Before Philip talked to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of the Jews. And Jesus said to him, do you believe that because I saw you under the fig tree? Well, you will see greater things than that. Can anything good come out of there? Can anything good come out of them? Can anything good come out of that thing? Yeah. Yeah, it can. You will see greater things. That's the business that God is in, making great things come out of places and from people that other folks think are just useless. They couldn't give a crap about it. Our job, I believe, if we want to be in the business of God, is to resist any system that marginalizes the people of Nazareth. To reject any system that marginalizes the people of Haiti or of Kenya, where this stole comes from. Any system that stigmatizes pregnant, unmarried teenagers, prostitutes, drunks, the kids who question their sexuality, everyone who questions their spirituality. Any system that disdains the poor, people of color, people with sickness, people of different abilities. The list goes on. Our job, if we want to be in the business of God, and you don't have to be, that's your choice. Our job is to love. And when the world stacks up against the powerless, it is our job to love them even more. Sometimes exactly like Jesus did by resisting their oppressors. It starts in spirit. It starts in heart. It might end there. I don't know. But if it faith, if faith does not go through liberation and protection and empowerment and transfer, transformation, I just, I just don't care about it. That's empty faith. That's just glorified unicorns and puppy dogs and politeness and who cares about that? If faith is not willing to name evil as evil, what's the point? Now, when I think of people who started and ended and saw a whole bunch in the middle had faith of the heart level with prayer and compassion, and people who could name evil as evil, and they worked hard for justice, and they stood up with personal sacrifice and endangerment, and the very few people who were able to balance those two, the list is short. The list is really short about people who could do that. I mean, I start with Jesus, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa. There's others, but the list is short. And since they can do that balancing act so much better than I can, amen? Amen. Yeah, they can. Um, I'm just going to read some of their words, right? If you got an issue with them, you got to go dig up a dead person. This is uh, from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama, 17 November 1957. I want to turn your attention to this subject, loving your enemies. It's so basic to me because it's part of my, this is Dr. King's, philosophical and theological orientation. The whole idea of love, the whole philosophy of love. In the fifth chapter of the gospel, as recorded by St. Matthew, we read these very arresting words, the words Fran read, flowing from the lips of our Lord and Master. Ye have heard it said that it, you, ye have heard that it has been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you, that ye may be the children of of your Father, which is in heaven. Certainly those are great words, words lifted to cosmic proportions. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far as to say it just isn't possible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. They would go on to say that this is just additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound. But far from being an impractical idealist, Jesus has become the practical realist. The words of this text glitter in our eyes with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. And in his church, people probably said amen. 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 See, I try to get into that system here because he did it really well. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization, love even for enemies. Now let me hasten to say that Jesus was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. And we cannot dismiss this passage as just another example of hyperbole. Just a sort of exaggeration to get over the point. This is the basic philosophy of all that we hear coming from the lips of our master. Because Jesus wasn't playing. He was serious. We have the Christian and moral responsibility to seek 
and discover the meanings of these words and to discover how we can live out this commandment and why should we should live by this command. I'm going to skip down a little bit to the most pertinent reason. And this is what Jesus means, according to Dr. King, in this very passage when he says, love your enemy. It is significant that he does not say, like your enemies. It is significant that he does not say, like your enemies. Like is a sentimental something, an affectionate something. There are a lot of people that I find it difficult to like. Amen? Amen. I don't like what they do to me. I don't like what they say about me and other people. I don't like their attitudes. I don't like some of the things they're doing. I don't like them. But Jesus says, love them. And love is greater than like. Love is understanding. Redemptive goodwill for all people. So that you love everybody because God loves them. You refuse to do anything that will defeat an individual because you have agape, Christian love, in your soul. And here you may come to the point that you love the individual who does the evil deed while hating the deed that the person does. This is what Jesus means when he says, love your enemy. I'll give you one more paragraph a little further down in the sermon. Now there is a final reason I think that Jesus says love your enemies. It is this, that love has within it a redemptive power. And there is a power there that eventually transforms individuals. That's why Jesus says, love your enemies. Because if you hate your enemies, you have no way to redeem and to transform your enemies. But if you love your enemies, you will discover that at the very root of love is the power of redemption. You just keep loving people and keep loving them, even though they're mistreating you. Here's the person who is a neighbor, and this person is doing something wrong to you and all that. Just keep being friendly to that person. Keep loving them. Don't do anything to embarrass them. Just keep loving them, and they can't stand it too long. Oh, they react in many ways in the beginning. They react with bitterness because they're mad, because you love them like that. They react with guilt feelings, and sometimes they'll hate you a little more at that transition period. But just keep loving them, and by the power of your love, they will break down under the load. That's love, you see. It is redemptive, and that's why Jesus says love. There is something about love that builds up and is creative. There is something about hate that tears down and is destructive. So love your enemies. Sounds pretty tough. Yeah? Sounds pretty tough to me. So to help me and to and, and keep me on that path, to remind, remind me of how those kind of spiritual people like Martin Luther King could possibly love their enemies while working hard to change the world in the face of grave evil, I'm going to hang these next words in my office. I'm going to close with the words that Mother Teresa had hanging in her bedroom at the convent that served the Sisters of Charity Orphanage. Maybe one day I'll figure out how to follow them. Until then, I'll just keep reading them. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind to them anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. When you spend years creating something that others can destroy overnight, create anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them. 